Well, good morning again. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath to you as well. Thank you for that. It is a happy Sabbath. It's a happy Sabbath because we know the Lord is coming and He's coming soon. Amen. And we can be happy. <clears throat> We're going to be talking about a depressive issue today. But keep in mind, if we take the joy of the Lord, Nehemiah said it was His strength. And I have learned the hard way that I have to take and receive the joy of the Lord. It just doesn't come without me doing anything. Mm -hmm. So take that joy. Well, I wanted to start out this morning and uh, last night I, I prepared this last week and last night the Lord changed it all. And so that happens oftentimes. One time um, in Africa, I was in Ghana, West Africa. I went there. Steps to Life sent me there. Those of you who know John Gospel's Steps to Life, the uh, actually dedicate an orphanage that they were, they had put together, and the work with the African people establishing a natural health clinic. Uh, and so I can remember when I first got there, uh, the church was packed with people, maybe several hundred people, and they, all of a sudden, it's time for the 11 o'clock service, and they say, you're speaking. <laughs> fear came over me. <laughs> I shouldn't admit that, but fear came over me. And uh, so I was able to overcome that. I got up, and it was amazing how God put the words in my mouth. You know, but He does that. And we want to give Him praise and glory. Amen. But we are living in a time when there is a lot of evil going on around the world. A lot of terrorism, uh, a lot of the shooters are shooting in America. There was one yesterday you probably knew about mm -hmm. in Texas. And last I heard there was ten little kids that were killed. Uh, and it just keeps going on and on and on. As a result of that, many people are depressed. They're depressed and fear comes out in various ways of where they're afraid. But we need to realize that we need to look up when those things come along. There may come a time when we have to face that ourselves. And we should joyfully be glad to give our lives for the Lord. You know, it tells us in Revelation 12:11. It says, we overcame him. Who's him? The devil. We overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. And what is the word of our testimony? Is it, I don't have victory? Or is it that we have victory? We need to confess with our tongue that Jesus has come into our lives and that we have victory. This is one way to overcome the depression. We're going to look at how we can overcome it biblically today. And uh, I hope I can be able to give this in a way that's understandable. So let's pray again for God's blessing. Heavenly Father, we again come to you and we pray that you will be in our midst as we know you are. We promise where two or three are gathered together there you would be in our midst. And we ask you to bless us and please help the words that I speak come from on high instead of my own. So again, I just thank you and ask this in the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. Well, <clears throat> people today are very fearful. In the work I've done over the years, I've seen that increase. When I started in medical work, medical missionary work, Oh, it's been almost 30 years ago now. Uh, people weren't as afraid as they are today. As I mentioned earlier today in the Sabbath school, that uh, we are dealing in a time where that is very frightening from the standpoint of view. It's very dangerous too. We never know whether we go into a shopping mall and something could happen. It's all the more reason that we should be ready to go at any time. That we should have that relationship with the Lord Himself. And that's what the Lord wants. He wants us to have a relation with Him 
an intimate relation, an intimate relation from the standpoint of view that we are close. He is our closest friend. And we're no longer servants according to what we're told in the Bible, what Jesus said himself to his apostles and disciples, is that you are my friends. And we want to develop that relationship with him. Okay, well, let's look at this thing called depression this morning. Uh, people today are fearful, as I mentioned. Uh, and oftentimes what they're doing is letting fear guide their life. They make bad decisions based on fear. And we should logically think things out prayerfully and ask God to make that decision for us. But yet I found that this fear is a major problem today and motivating factor that is leading people the wrong direction. And as uh, my brother had said earlier, there's a lot of fanaticism and every wind of doctrine. And people sometimes get involved in these winds of doctrine because of the fear. Uh, well, maybe I better, maybe I better go in and maybe that's the right way. The problem is they've never really studied the word themselves. They need to study the word and know without a, a, a doubt in their mind what the Lord teaches. Amen. And then we can have the truth and the truth will truly make us free. Amen. Uh, the next is worry. Worry, these are all factors that lead into depression. Worry that things will, won't go their way. Now this definition was given to me. I had a young psychiatrist. Uh, he had just finished his residency in Loma Linda and he came out to my program to learn. He didn't come out to go through because he had a health problem. He didn't. And this is what he told me. He says, people are worried that things just won't go their way. And we need not to worry. You know, we're only here a short period of time. I've fallen, I've fallen into so many traps when I was younger, and I pray I, don't, I never do again. But when I was young, I, I had three businesses going, I made a lot of money, and in fact, one business I made a lot of money. But you know, my heart was to do ministry, health ministry, and God took it all away from me. And I don't regret it. I don't regret it at all because the fact is that he led me in a different direction or I wouldn't be up here today. I may have lost my soul because I followed money rather than him and his spirit. And the next is, well, I did want to mention with worry, I had a patient by the name, and this isn't her real name, I changed the names. <laughs> But I like to use names with the story that I'm telling. So I don't want anybody to know who they are. But anyway, her name was Laura. And Laura was a worry ward. She worried about everything. Her husband died fairly young and she stayed single the rest of her life. And he left her enough money to be able to take care of her for several lifetimes. And what did she do? Worried. She came out of the Great Depression and she was constantly worried that she would not have enough money. So she didn't spend any of it. And of course, at her death, there was quite a sizable amount for her children to fight over. <laughs> so anyway, unfortunately that happened. Another is panic. This also adds to the problem of depression and panic. I may have told this story last time I was here last year, but it's kind of classic. I had a young couple. He was uh, 30 years old, a graduate of Walla Walla. He had a degree in uh, writing and in uh, basically English. And his wife was 27 and she had a, a degree, well she had an MBA, uh, a Master's in Business Administration. But yet they were totally, totally dysfunctional because of depression. So he tried to cover up the, dis, uh, the depression by smoking pot, uh, 
He, he drank, a, drank a ton of coffee every day, which is a depressant itself. And we have to be careful for drinking coffee when and it starts to wear off. It can bring depression upon people. Many people are depressed today because of caffeine. So he was on that. He was on uh, uh, a couple of prescription antidepressant drugs. He was on what they call a cocktail. And uh, he, was, he had a couple of other substances that he enjoyed taking. But he panicked. Here he is, young, graduate, has a good education, and yet he's totally depressed, and he had panic disorder to where every day he would have several episodes of where he would just stand in the corner and retch like he was going to throw up. He would be shaking all over his body, and the only way he kept a job was because he had a relative that owned the business. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been able to keep a job just about any place he went. Now she, on the other hand, was so depressed that she tried to, to remedy it by drinking wine, a bottle of wine or two, every day, along with Valium. Can you imagine what a combination that might be? She could have killed herself. And so uh, they heard about me, and they called to, to schedule, because for those who don't know, I used to have a health ranch called Restoration Ranch. And Restoration Ranch, we had a 10-day program where people would come and stay with us 10 days. And we worked on cleansing the body and bringing their health back. We have uh, many testimonies about it, but this is one of them. And so, anyway, they called. They scheduled to come on a certain date, and then they called just before the date and canceled. Then they rescheduled. And the second time, they canceled, just before they came. Then the third time, they called. We asked them, the interviewer, it wasn't myself, but the interviewer, I was in the room, so I overheard it because it was on speakerphone. And the interviewer said to him, it was the, the man, said, oh, are you afraid, he was ready to cancel again, he said, are, she, are you afraid? to leave your demons at home. I was shocked to hear that. And uh, he said, after a long silence, you have to understand, I've made friends with my demons. I, uh, we said, come. So we anointed the gate, and we, and we did that quite regularly because we had to do fights against uh, spiritual wickedness in people's lives in order to bring their health back. And we don't realize that. As I mentioned this morning, there are a lot of diseases that are aggravated by or even caused by demonic uh, demons that are actually bringing disease into people's lives. And then sometimes through certain faith healers, they will take them off, appearing that they are healed from that particular disease. But in this case, these young people were definitely plagued with, uh, with demons, probably many of them, probably a legion of them. I don't know how many. So we anointed the gate and prayed over it before they came. And our experience is the demons don't go past the gate. So they came, and the, the first day, we're dealing with depression now, the first day he felt so good that he gave me... Uh, his 10 little friends or 20, what's in a package of cigarettes? 10 or 20? I don't know. <laughs> Whatever they are. But he, gave, he said, these are my 10 or 20 little friends. So we had a little ceremony and they went swimming. <laughs> <laughs> and so the next day he came to me and gave me his bag of pot. Well, in those days it was illegal at that point. So we, we also had a burial at sea, but we got rid of them. And every day he brought me something. And to find out with his wife, she, dump, she dumped her Valium herself, and we found out that she had in the trunk of her car four cases of wine. She didn't use any of them. They straightened their life out 
And this is, we give credit to God. Because the Lord helped them through the principles we're going to go over today to be able to give up depression in their life. He went back to school, became a graduate school, and became a, an attorney. He was now, last year, uh, had received an honor of being one of the top attorneys in the state of California. And she, uh, with her MBA, was able to find work that she could do at home on the computer and homeschool their little son. It changed totally around without drugs, without major therapy. And we'll talk about the drugs in a little bit and what they can do to us. And, and it's a problem that we have today. You know, I think we all, as I mentioned as in Sabbath school, we all are under stress in some varying degrees. Some people have a lot of stress in their life, others have very little. And, but yet, there's stress in stressful times. But if we can't cope with it, and we need to go take a drug in which to cope with it, then we are not ready for the time of trouble that's coming upon this earth. We won't make it through. We have got to get ourselves prepared because it's coming. God has put it off long enough for all of us in this room to prepare our lives for soon events that's going to, in my opinion, I believe from what I see, is that America is going to be basically destroyed. And uh, we're going to be in the midst of it. Are we ready for it? Probably not. And so we're going to look at this today to be able to overcome. Um, well, we read a few minutes ago in Matthew, Matthew 16, verse 24 and through 26. I just want to go over that again quickly. Verse 24 says, Then Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. What does it mean in America to deny oneself? We don't want to deny anything, do we? We want to have what's ever available. But let me just tell you a story. A story about myself and how I didn't want to deny anything either at one time. I wanted to be wealthy because I came from a very full poor background. So I started a business in about 1978. And this business was called Western Contractors Association. It was a, an association where I brought people in the building trades into it and small businesses and I could sell them insurance less than what they could get on the open market. Pretty soon it was just multiplying. I made more money than I could th thought of. I'd have, I had a home that I built on a hill with uh, overlooking, if you guys probably don't know the area, but Oak Glen in California. And it was almost 4,000 square feet. I had five bedrooms. I had it built, and I didn't know anything on it. I did it with cash. That's how much I was making at the time. But I, I went, wanted to serve God. But this business was taking me further and further away from God. It required more of my time. And so, anyway, what happened in 1983, the Lord took care of that problem for me because I had all of my insurance in one company, in an A-rated company. I got a phone call. This A-rated company, 100 and some year old company, just went bankrupt. I was instantly out of business. Not only that, claims would never be paid, so guess who they looked to? I had six major lawsuits against me and three small claims. And my, uh, my lawyer said, just we can hide your assets and you file bankruptcy. He says, no, I'm a Christian. As long as I have money, I'm going to pay those claims. So I paid them all. I was broke at the end of it. I traded my nice car off for an Oldsmobile that had a diesel engine in it. You could hear me coming, and when I got close, you could smell it too. <laughs> 
So anyway, those are the days that General Motors had diesels in some of the GM cars. So, uh, so as a result of that, I ended up going to work for the church after that. Uh, I, was, I had a calling to go to Loma Linda and be a claims manager. About six months later, I had a calling to go into the general conference and work as a director of employee benefit services for the whole North American division. And so I did that. Then later on, I had a calling to come back to Loma Linda and work for the med center as a, uh, a manager for a new health maintenance organization they were building. Well, I, was, I, I didn't make a lot of money in the church, nor did I care to, because it took, got me back into working with the Lord and exactly what I wanted to do all along. The money didn't matter. It doesn't now, because I don't have, I'm 75 years old, I've sold all my properties, and I still don't have a lot of money. Praise God, because they were a hindrance. I'm no longer depressed either because I don't have to worry about losing anything. I don't have anything. <laughs> I can get prepared now for the Lord. And this is what we need to do. I use my own example because I know it best. And I know what emotions I went through. But we're, we're told in Psalms 37, uh, I think it's verse 3. Let me look it up. And... Psalms 37. Sorry for delay. Here it is. Psalms 37, verse 3. Trust in the Lord. Wow. Trust in the Lord. How many of us have enough faith that we actually trust God? You know, this word right here is His word. It's just like the Lord would be down front here or up here where I'm at right now and he would be speaking these words. We would believe them, but when we read them, we oftentimes don't. He will provide for us. It goes on to tell us and says, Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land and verily thou shalt be fed. And verse 4, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. What's the real true desire of your heart? Are you depressed because you're not getting what you want in life? It didn't go the way I wanted it, but it went the way God wanted it. And it still goes the way God wants it. So I, my heart's desire is to serve him. And I pray that your heart's desire is to do the same thing. If you will do that, depression will flee. It, I flee. I said flee. I didn't mean that. Flee. So we delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy ways unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. What a wonderful promise. But he knows the deep things of the heart. And we need to, to realize that the deep things of the heart may not be what we consciously really want in our life itself. So when people become Christians, oftentimes they think that everything's going to go well for them. I became an Adventist Christian when I was 30 years old. And I, th I thought that things would be a whole lot better. The way I became an Adventist was I was led in really kind of by the Lord in that uh, I had been a, pre a Presbyterian and I was a youth director for the Presbyterian church I was a member of and I, I, to myself I thought this is just nothing more than a coffee and donuts between Sunday school and church. It's a social gathering. There was no meat to the, any of the sermons there. And I'm not putting them down. I'm just saying from my perspective. And so I ended up going to Baptist Church, which I liked it better. And uh, other churches, I, I visited around trying to find the truth. And one night, I, I knelt down by my bed before I went to sleep. I was 29 years old. 
and I ask the Lord what is true I can't find it not in the churches that next week uh, I had two new clients that I wish to interview one was a uh, did a catering business and uh, so I went to visit with her the writer insurance I had a farmer's agency at the time farmer's insurance and as a result uh, she uh, asked me would you like Bible studies and I said I don't know I'll think about it <laughs> and I had, the next one was an accountant and he too asked me if I wanted Bible study I had lots of Adventist clients and I thought they were the strangest people in the world <laughs> because when I would call up on Saturday morning to to do some servicing in their account they told me I can't speak to you but they wouldn't tell me why <laughs> another thing is is that they didn't eat right they were vegetarians they looked pasty to me <laughs> and I said no Lord you're not sending me this direction are you <laughs> and so as a result of that yes he did send me that direction that same week I was driving by a, a church in San Bernardino, an Adventist church in the middle of the week on a Thursday. And there was two cars in the parking lot. And I thought, there must be a pastor there. So I went in and sure enough, the pastor and the secretary. And he about fell off his chair that, I, that somebody walked in off the street. But he spent an hour and a half with me, gave me the whole conflict series, and says, be here Sabbath and I'll baptize you. I didn't know a thing, but I, I came and was baptized. Now, now I am one. And so I came in the next Sabbath to that church, and it was the deadest church I'd ever been in. They didn't even, the greeters didn't even greet. So I said, Lord, what am I doing here? But I kept feeling in the spirit, this is where I needed to be. I was rebaptized a couple of years later when I knew what I was into. But the fact is, God is good. Amen. And He will take and guide you in any way you want. He guided me that way. And I have never looked back. And I praise God for that. Amen. So, anyway, uh, trials are a problem that bring us about, bring about uh, depression in one's life. And last year when I came, I talked about how Satan strikes children in fear, to be able to control them during their lifetime. But he also does that with us, us adults. And so we need to overcome the fear. You know, we don't know what God has for us, but if we're a Christian, God has work for each and every one of us in this room. Amen. We just don't often give him enough time to do it, or fear maybe prevents it. Maybe that fear is of rejection. I will go out into the community and I'm going to be rejected. Somebody's going to laugh at me because I keep the Sabbath. They're going to tell me, which I've had them tell me, that you're keeping the wrong day. I say, well, I beg your pardon. <laughs> I had one time my mother set me up. My mother prayed for me. She thought I was lost when I became an Adventist. And she had the Church of Christ minister waiting for me in her house. When I walked in, he said, start, started hitting me with the Sabbath. I said, I know my Bible. I showed him the Sabbath. He got so mad, he took his Bible, slammed it shut, and yelled at me and, and pointed at me and said, you are guilty of, uh, of abominable heresy. And he walked out. My mother never spoke that way again to me. After she saw how he reacted, because he did not act as a Christian. So it's important. All right. Well, we can look at some examples in the Bible. We know that Pharaoh decreed to kill all the baby boys when Moses was a young boy. It must have been very stressful on his family, on his mother, uh, on, his, on his brother and sister. We know of, of uh, his brother and sister. But yet, he survived it. And by surviving, he became a prince in Egypt, and we know the trials that he went through after he was 40 years old. This is what encourages me, because he really became a minister for God more at age 80. I'm getting close to that, so I like to think that maybe God's going to use me as I get older even more. 
So we got to hang on. You know, when we're in the Lord's service, we don't retire. We don't retire. We're always in this service and always will be. King Herod tried to kill baby Jesus, didn't he? And his parents had to flee. We know that Satan tried to destroy Jesus right after the 40 days in the wilderness. And we find the apostles, all of them died uh, a martyr's death all but John. And so we can say ourselves that becoming a Christian isn't always the, the safest thing in the world, particularly if you're in Syria or someplace like that. But the fact is, is that we have to be willing to be able to give our life to the Lord. Now, if we're willing to give our life to the Lord, why do we need to be depressed? Because we know our reward, what it will be. And so it's important. It goes on, my notes say here, does this, when in God's will, when we're in God's will, all hell can come against us. It can all come against us. But yet, we can rebuke it. Did you know you have authority to rebuke this hell, so to speak, or to rebuke these demons or devils? You know, the, the King James Bible calls them devils. The demon is not mentioned in the New King, or in the King James. But these devils, which I prefer to call them anyway because I think it describes them better, you can keep them in their place. Now we have, uh, at times, uh, are being attacked, which you all are too. And so we try to recognize that and we ask God to be able to recognize it. And one of the things that we need to get rid of, and we'll talk more about it at, uh, this afternoon, a little bit yet today, and uh, are now, and that is uh, strongholds. A lot of people don't even know what a stronghold is. A stronghold basically is a fortress. And as a result of that fortress, uh, well, let me just read a Second Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4, I'm sorry, 3, 4, and 5. Okay, second Corinthians ten. Should have marked it. Alright. Verse four is what I'm really interested in, but look but let's just look at this for a minute. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of what? So if we are pulling down strongholds, we should really know what they are, shouldn't we? Amen. Casting down imagination. I'll stop there for a minute because in a minute I'll get into a little bit of that. But the strongholds, we went, we went to the strongs uh, and we, we looked up the number uh, and we found that strongholds is used a number of times in the Bible, but it's only used in this sense once and this is right here in this particular passage. And the stronghold would basically represent a fort or a fortress. And in this fortress, uh, it's to keep the enemy out. But what happens if the enemy is inside and builds the fortress around? That's basically what it is. And the way we like to describe it is by brick by brick by brick. Go back to fear. When we're afraid, as a child, there's a brick there, maybe the, fall of the, the fear of falling, the fear of loud noises, the fear of whatever they're taught. It might be the fear of cars. Some children are afraid to ride in cars. And they keep building this fortress around a retaining wall, like a retaining wall, but it's to hold things in, not out. So. The demons make themselves comfortable and if they can continue this building with these blocks, it's going to get to the place where it becomes part of us and we become afraid. That was kind of my experience. My experience has been 
when I was young, I was afraid of a lot of things. Now, in the Army, I volunteered for the one of the toughest units, and I was in it. I was a Green Beret. I did that because I was afraid. I wanted to prove that I could be brave. I wanted, I wanted to prove to myself that I could be a good soldier. And so I, I joined the military that way. But that's not the right reason. That fortress has to be broken down and only you can do it. And the only way that you can do it, and this will get rid of depression because it is a big fortress in this country, probably around the world, as to break down those bricks one by one. How do you do it? Through truth. Amen. Truth will break it down and only by truth. You need to know the promises that can pertain to you. Like for depression, um, we're told that we are to be anxious for nothing. So when depression comes along, we tell those demons or devils that we are not going to be anxious, we are not going to be uh, depressed, because and the Bible tells us we are to be anxious for nothing. Amen. And it weakens it. And each time we do it, it weakens it a little more. And pretty soon, those bricks go flying off. And we're no longer depressed. We no longer need Prozac. We no longer need the antidepressant drugs. And it goes on to say in verse 5, it says, Casting down imaginations. Now, imaginations is a big thing because psychiatrists, psychologists say it's very healthy to have these imaginations. And imaginations can be evil. We can meditate on the wrong things. And we know that by doing so, that we are bringing sin into our life. And one of the, and this is something that uh, people don't like to hear, but I'm going to say it anyway, and that is they oftentimes, particularly men, meditate upon sexual immorality. I had a pastor come to my program probably 15 years ago, and he said he was hooked on pornography. He says he knows that the church, what, he wasn't an Adventist pastor, he was a pastor of another denomination. And he says, I know that if my church found out about it, I would lose total credibility and probably lose my church. He said, but I can't seem to overcome it. So we had to work on the porno type of bricks to bring this down so that he didn't imagine. We are to take control of our mind. You say, how do you do that? I had to learn to do it on myself to be able to take control of my mind so that I didn't think of things. I had a lot of anger at one time in my life, and I would think on angry types of subjects. And I, now, I am not an angry person. I don't get angry. And I praise God for that. I'm not taking credit for any of this. Only the Lord Jesus Christ can free us. We can be free indeed if we know the truth. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted against the knowledge of God and bringeth into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So we've got to bring it every thought into the obedience of Christ. And brothers and sisters, we have the authority given to us. You can find that in the last couple of verses of the book of Mark. And Mark 16. And we can trample on the devil. It says snakes and scorpions. But those snakes and scorpions are more in the form of devils. And we can do that. Okay. Uh, I'm going to get into this right now. I'm going to get into the physical part of it, of how we are symptoms of depression. <laughs> symptoms of depression is somebody that maybe has gone through a terrible disappointment. I'm going to watch my time. Um, I have a tendency to talk too long. So, you guys, if I get close to that, let me know. And I'll stop. But I had um, a, a, a lady. She was also a historical Adventist back in Oklahoma. She had uh, breast cancer. She'd gone through two divorces. And she truly loved her husbands, both of them. They both deserted her, basically. 
And when she came out to California to go through the program, she asked me, uh, am I so unlovable that I can't keep a husband? And I said, that's not the problem. And so we started working with this disappointment because she was very depressed. And the only way that we could help her with her cancer is to help her get off the depression. So let me tell you, one of the uphill battles I had for 25 years of working with the sick people, and the majority of the diseases that I got was cancer itself. And if I couldn't give them hope, then I didn't think that it would survive, and usually they didn't. So we had to give them hope, and part of it was to take care of disappointment, pain and hurt, and despair, hopelessness, and all of those emotional feelings. And if they got hope, there was a chance, in my opinion, God would heal them. In fact, a very excellent chance. I'll give you a couple of examples. This particular lady, uh, uh, we had eight people going through the program at the time. All of them were Seventh-day Adventists, and all of them were basically historical. And they believed in the power of God in healing. They believed he could heal. Don't you? Or do we? Now, I don't want to get into it. But people will get into it with me. But the fact is, is that what do we do? We find out we've got a diagnosis of cancer. First thing we do is start uh, scheduling ourselves for radiation therapy, chemotherapy, surgery, before we go to God. We need to give God a chance. Well, this particular lady, we... She wanted to have be anointed, so we anointed her, we laid hands upon her, and guess what? God healed her instantly. All of her tumors, she had tumors in both breasts, were gone. At least. One of the participants there said, are you going to go back to your doctor to confirm that you've been healed? She said, no, that's a lack of faith. God healed me, and I'm going to stand on it. And so she did. And we saw others. Uh, probably all of you know Dr. Lorraine Day or who she is. She held on to, I know her, I worked with her at one time, and um, she held on to the promises of God. She came to the place, she used to have Bible studies every Thursday night in her office in Palm Desert. Well, I, I would go there uh, and to the Bible study. There were about 40 people that came. And all of a sudden, Lorraine didn't show up anymore. And we asked Charles, her husband, what was wrong? And he said, oh, she's taking a sabbatical. She's been working too hard. We all knew she had cancer. But what we didn't know, she was dying. But they closed the office, and the last night of the Bible study, it was going to be canceled because she couldn't do it anymore. Charles went home and found her laying on the bathroom floor. She couldn't get up. She was so weak. And he told her, I'm taking you to the hospital. And Lorraine says, no. That's a lack of faith. I'm depending on God. I'm holding on to his promises. Charles said to her, what if you die? What will the family think of me? She said, don't think of yourself. Think towards God. Have faith. That's when she turned around. Within just a few months, two or three months, the cancer was gone in her life. And I've seen that happen with others. Uh, there was another one that was a friend of mine, another lady by the name of Anne Fromm. I don't know whether you've heard of her. She wrote a book that used to be in all the health food stores year, a few years back called The Cancer Battle Plan. And Anne um, was a young mother, and she had double breast cancer. She was in the hospital, had uh, radical mastectomy on both breasts. Uh, the cancer was stage four, was eating through the bone. She had bones that were broken because the cancer had gone through it. The charge nurse came in that night and said, Mrs. Fromm, we don't think you'll live through the night. It's time to say goodbye to your family. So her husband came in and they prayed and they cried. They prayed, they called upon the promise of God. She did not die. So the hospital says, go home and die there. We need your bed. And they told her almost exactly that way from what she said. So as a result of that, she uh, and her husband prayed. She went home, and they, they didn't know what to do. Naturally, they'd have 
chemotherapy, radiation therapy, surgery, what do we do? And so they went to the Yellow Pages and they found a nutritionist, a, a lady, that knew about cleansing. That's what we did. Cleansed the body, fed her the nutrition she needed, and counseled her to get rid of depression in her life. She said, I don't have depression. I'm looking to the Lord. How can I be depressed when I trust Him? Within six weeks, she was totally healed. All the bones were healed. The doctors were going like this, spontaneous remission. There's no spontaneous remission. It's Jesus Christ healed her. So, but, but she was able to get rid of the depression. Anyway, hopelessness, uh, being alone. Uh, you know, I have experienced this. I've experienced the fact that here I am an Adventist Christian, and uh, because I'm historical in nature, I feel alone oftentimes. I used to. And it, it can be devastating and can bring about depression, inactivity. Okay, I've got to go faster. Uh, these are other symptoms of depression. No motivation. Can't think. That the mind is just not allowing you to think and unable to concentrate and make decisions. It's a problem. Increased eating. Oftentimes with a depression, people become quite large because they eat too much and uh, decreased appetite, low energy, and, and the like, like that. I had a, one of my first cases that I had, I had training in Australia, I was there for a number of months, in a self-supporting institute called Living Valley Springs. And Living Valley Springs uh, was Adventist, independent Adventist control or run. And when I went over there to learn, they also let me be the manager of their sanitarium. One of my first patients was an 18-year-old girl. Her mother called the day that she was to arrive before she arrived. Said, my daughter's coming. Says, she's anorexic, very depressed, and a bulimic both. She said she's had three different psychiatrists and been inpatient six times. She said, I don't think your program will help her, but she will try. When she came, uh, I, I interviewed her, and through the interview, I asked her, have you tried Jesus Christ? Have you cried out to him? Because I had asked her, did you know you have a problem? And she said, yes, I do know it. And so as a result of that, we prayed. She said her family, was not religious. She heard of Jesus, but she didn't know much about him. I said, would you like to know? She said, yes. So we, we talked to her about the Lord. She accepted him on the spot. Not only that, but she healed. She was healed miraculously of her problem. She wanted every spirit of book, prophecy book we had. We gave her a Bible. And she had a stack of books that she bought like this. She took home. And you know what happened to that 18-year-old girl? She became a medical missionary. Mm -hmm. Because she was able to give up and act through the Lord depression. So it's important. All right. Uh, sleep, sleep more, feel rejected. You can read it up there. I've got to go faster. I won't get through. And why depressed? Family history through watching the parents, through environments, so on. I'll just leave that up there, but I want to turn to my notes as one other area I definitely want to get into. Um, okay, we're going to break these uh, bricks down. Let's talk about the drugs for a minute. Uh, these SSRI drugs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, the idea is to be able to keep the serotonin levels in your brain from leaving. Now, there was a, uh, some research done in Israel by a Dr. Hesep, Hesep, I think it is how it's pronounced, and he found that the drug companies in our country 
have the wrong premise that they can create a condition where there's too much serotonin and what that does can cause people to do what they call hit the wall and they have a 65% more chance of becoming violent and suicidal and homicidal. And so every, almost every one of the shooters, including the one yesterday we don't know about at this point, that they all were on one of these drugs, all of them. So uh, I probably mentioned that before. But the fact is, is that there are dangers. If any of you are on those drugs, and I suspect there are some in here, then don't go off cold turkey. They have to go off very slowly. Titrate down, which means to take a little bit less each day. And if you've been on it a long time, it may take six months to get off of them. If you've been on a short time, it won't take that long. But the fact is, they're that addictive. And they can create this hitting the wall where you lash out and, and you might injure yourself. Now, I had a situation where I had a young woman come to the program probably 20, 20 years ago now, and she uh, came and she, had, she was from South America and, and one was going to college, but she couldn't concentrate. She couldn't think of anything. And so we, we gave her a room and she went through it. About two days into the program, she came out to me and said, Mike, there's feathers floating all over my room. They must be coming out of the pillow. And so we, I went in there. Well, I must be blind because there were no, there were no feathers. <laughs> so we changed everything out for her. Same thing, just different color. And then the next year she brought her mother back and went through and she told me the story. She'd been on Prozac and when she came to the program she cold turkey went off without telling me. She says, for three days she said I was planning on killing you, killing me. I'm glad that the Lord intervened. <laughs> so, nevertheless, uh, we were able to, through God, through the Lord, to be able to take care of her depression. She was able to get off of Prozac. Well, she got herself off in a very unrealistic way. And so she, she did well. And so it's very important uh, the, that we, if we're on those drugs, be careful. That's all I got to say. I won't say any more. Um, well, Adversity, I wanted to mention that, and we'll look at the clock. I'm sorry, oh, I got 15 minutes, oh boy. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, I wanted to talk about what adversity does to us. When we're young, and we go through adversity, it strengthens us. And I'll just tell you, in nature, how God uses adversity. Let's look at an eagle. That's our national symbol. I can see and on the top of the flag in the back of the room here. And uh, the eagle itself, when a little, when the eggs are laid and after about 40 days or so, the little uh, eaglets want to hatch. They got a problem. Their beaks go like this. They're not like a chicken or something else we can pack pretty much out. And it takes sometimes 36 hours for them to be able to break through the shell. And they are very dead tired when they come out. I shouldn't say dead. They're very tired when they come out. <laughs> so anyway, uh, what happens was the scientists have found that if they help the, the eagle get out of the egg, uh, what will happen is that eagle will not survive in the wild. Mm -hmm. This adversity is good. My mother, <clears throat> my mother grew up in the Depression, a family of 12, on a very poor farm in a little town called Clayton, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Clayton, Oklahoma is up in the hills, so my mother and, fa and her family were all hillbillies. Mm -hmm. I come from hillbilly stock. Mm -hmm. And so, as a result of that, um, what happened was that my grandpa 
who is well, he was my role model. He was really great to me. I was his oldest grandchild. After twelve kids, they had lots of grandchildren. So, but anyway, I was the firstborn, and uh, at that time, he had good land. They got the land during the 1909 land rush that uh, Oklahoma had. You've probably seen pictures of all the wagons and people are lined up on a certain time. They shoot the gun and they could go out and they could homestead acreage free of charge that the government was given as long as it wasn't on one of the Indian reservations. So we got the land and it was good land. It was good uh, fertile land right next to a river. And they raised many good crops on it. My grandfather inherited it. And um, this particular year he planted his crops and the floods came and washed them all out. So the first time in his life he had to go to the bank and mortgage the property. He became depressed as a result of it. But he did. He re receded again and then the same thing happened. He lost it all again. So they decided to go to the promised land of California. <laughs> And so either Oregon or California, I would, I would stay away from California now. <laughs> so anyway, uh, as they came out, they had enough money to get to Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, in those days, people lived, uh, they would live and sleep on the side of the road. It was pretty safe then. So my grandfather went to work for a gas station to earn enough money to get to the rest of the way. And so I talked to my, my mother's siblings, my uncles and aunts. I said, were you guys depressed because you didn't have anything? You didn't even have time to play because as soon as you could walk, you had to go help out in the fields. They said, no, we were never depressed. We had each other and we had God. Amen. So it didn't matter that we didn't have anything as long as we had God and each other. So we have our priorities sometimes wrong. That brings about depression itself. So trials can be good. And let me just get to the bottom line here because I'm just running out of time. We need to examine ourselves and examine uh, what kind of problems we might have in our life and see if it's really worth being depressed being worried about, having fear over it, panic over it. If it's not, and I don't think there's anything unless we're not following God, that would be the only thing. It would be a problem. I want to take you over to uh, Revelation chapter 3 real quick. And we're going to look at a scripture there as we kind of wind down here as the clock is beating away. Okay, but we're going to look at Revelation 3 and we're starting with verse 18. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. Now what's it mean to be tried in the fire? You know, I used to live up in Placerville. It's only a few miles away from where God was discovered, gold, not God, I'm sorry, I wish God would be discovered in that part of the country. Gold, uh, and there's a lot of mining equipment still around. They would take the ore and they would break it down with these huge hammers like, they call them crushing machines, and the powder would then go into a furnace. Very hot, and the gold would melt off by the precious metal. And then they would make uh, gold bars and they would stamp it on the top of 99% pure. But when God tries us in the fire, what comes out is 100% pure. And so we have to realize we're going to be tried in the fire. It's going to be hot. It's going to be unpleasant until we submit to God. If because if we're Christians, that's going to happen. We're not a Christian, God doesn't bother. But if we are Christians, 
He wants us to be fit for heaven to be able to take his hand. Why do we need to get depressed when we have trial? You know, it tells us in Ephesians 5, 20, that we're to give thanks for all things. It didn't say it when things only went right in our life. We are to give thanks for all things. So let's start giving thanks for God. Get up in the morning. You know what our habit is? Is that we, as we, when we wake up in the morning, we'll lay there for a few moments and we thank God. We praise Him and start the day with praise. Then we kneel together and we, we praise Him because if you go to Revelation and see how the 4 and 20 elders and angels uh, worship God, they would prostrate themselves and cry out, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Why are we less? Why shouldn't we spend time on our knees? This is a way to overcome everything. And we must overcome. Remember the last part of the verse I said in Revelation 12, 11. The last part is, and we love not our life unto death. There's nothing on this earth that should draw us away from God and make us depressed. It's very important. Then, I'm not going to read it because my time is just about gone. And that is, um, you can read it yourself. That is the 12th chapter of Hebrews. And it talks about the discipline that God will do for us. And I'll give you the exact in a minute when I look at my notes here, wherever I left them. Uh, I guess I didn't write it down because I used to go to, oh, Hebrews 12, 5 through 10. Hebrews 12, 5 through 10. And you can see that God, who God loves, He disciplines. Who God loves, trials come about to be able to bring us into a closer relationship with Him. And we should give thanks for even trials. Now that was a hard thing for me. I had um, a brother in the church who said, why don't you give thanks for your trial? It took me a few weeks before I could. I had a problem with that. But once I started thanking God, the trials didn't seem to be so much. Try it, because God wants us to thank Him. Remember, God inhabits the praises of His people. And we're His people, and we need to be thanking Him. So every morning we thank God before we get out of bed. We thank Him for a variety of things. Whatever comes to mind. We might even thank Him for hot water. You know, we might take little things like that for granted. Usually we thank you for more meteor things than that, but it's just an example. And I'm going to close with one more scripture in Isaiah chapter 20. I put all these tabs in here and they fall out. So, it didn't work real well for me. One more page. I heard John Grossball one time give a sermon. And he said, it's an insult to God to wet your fingers and turn the pages in the Bible. So I stopped doing it. And now I, the page I want is stuck together. There we go, I got it. Uh, I said chapter 20, I meant chapter 40. No wonder it was stuck together. Oh, I'll get there. Sorry about the delay. Okay, chapter 40. I'm on 39, so I'm getting close. All right. The last three verses, 29, 30, and 31. This is the Lord now. He giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might. He increases strength. Don't we all need to have our strength increased in the Lord? 
He will do that for us. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they, you know the rest of it, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. So we need to mount up as wings as eagles and be strong. Amen. Amen. All right. If anyone, I barely touched the subject. If you have questions this afternoon, we'll try to answer them for you. So I'm going to close now with prayer. Gracious Father, I thank you that we can have a way of escape from the devil, from the demons and devils that come after us to try to deceive us and lie to us. But if we know the truth, and I ask God that every one of us in this room would study to show our self-approval. Amen. And that they, we would know your word and don't take necessarily other people's word for it. We need to know ourselves, And we thank you. Go with us for the remainder of this day. And we ask your blessing upon Jesus our Savior and Lord. Amen.